My name is Jay Williams. I'm the president of the Hartford Foundation for Public Giving uh, and want to also introduce there are a number of staff members. So if the Hartford Foundation staff members can just sort of wave your hand. Uh, these are, this is the brain trust behind the foundation. Uh, and I want to first and foremost thank you all for your hospitality. Thank you for joining us for a conversation uh, in a listening session that I will explain uh, in just a very few minutes. I want to thank uh, the superintendents here and some of the school officials who helped facilitate uh, us gathering here. Thank you all for that. Uh, we don't take for granted that this is, uh, you all have busy days and busy lives with family and jobs and a whole host of other things and that you've gathered here uh, with us for an opportunity for uh, me to do less talking, us to do less talking, and to do a lot of listening uh, about the relationship that we as a uh, foundation have had with our 29 communities over the past 93 years, but a relationship that we are very much interested in reimagining and deepening that relationship. Uh, and the best way to do that is to hear uh, from the constituents that we serve in their own communities. So I'll get into that in just a few minutes, but I want to start off by uh, showing uh, a video. One of the facts that was pointed out in the video is that we are one of the oldest and largest community foundations in the entire country. The oldest and largest, one of the oldest and largest in the country, the largest in the state of Connecticut. And as a community foundation, we are your foundation. It's the Hartford Foundation for Public Giving, but we wanna be very clear that it serves 29 communities in the greater capital region. So a part of what we uh, are doing this evening is having a conversation and making sure that we are hearing and responding to the priorities, the concerns, the aspirations of the residents and the stakeholders in those 29 communities. And there's no better way to do that than, again, coming and hearing directly from those individuals. One of the things that was also pointed out is that we only exist because of the generosity, the philanthropic aspirations and willingness of donors from across those 29 communities. Uh, one of the families that has been exceptionally generous, and just a few weeks ago I had an opportunity to sit with them, uh, to talk to them as they continued their generosity, was the Holcomb family, who uh, is familiar to many people in this area. And they are just one example, but a very powerful example, of why we are able to do what we do. Most importantly is making sure that we not only have a conversation, but we hear and capture what is said tonight. And to that extent, uh, I hope everyone, and I see a lot of you have it in your hands, and if you don't, they're on the chairs, comment cards. The staff and I are going to be capturing uh, everything that's discussed, but there may be something that you forget or something that you're not comfortable saying or, or sort of just rather have a little more detail. So by all means, please uh, make use of the comment cards. Uh, we are also capturing this, uh, as you can see, on uh, video and, and audio. So as we have this discussion, there is a mic that we will pass around, and, and please use the microphone so it is able to be captured on the audio and video. Uh, we are curious as to uh, part of what brought you here this evening. We made a concerted effort to get the word out by way of social media, uh, the traditional media, radio and television and print ads and uh, you know, sometimes we've even gone so far as putting posters up on, uh, you know, the telephone poles and the streets in, in the town centers. So how many of you uh, were here because you either got an email or something on social media? Good, good. How many of you are here because you saw or heard uh, something on, on traditional media, either radio, TV, or print media? Okay. How many word of mouth? Good. Good, which, I mean, the grapevine always, you know, no matter technological failures or advancements, the grapevine is always, uh, and how many of you simply just kind of maybe wandered into this room and thought that there was <laughs> like snacks and cakes and all sorts of, uh, that's okay too. The bottom line is you're here, and, and that is our goal. We have made a commitment uh, to engage each of the 29 communities that we serve in a very intentional and deliberate manner. Uh, this is our third session, and each time uh, we try to get better and better at it, making sure that we have uh, a wide array and a diverse array of stakeholders. Uh, I'm glad to see we have some young people here uh, this evening. We have uh, elected officials here this evening. Uh, uh, several of you introduce yourself as, as citizens, and that's exactly what we want. Uh, we have nonprofit partners that attend, but we don't want to come and have a conversation or hear from the people who we 
uh, know very well and cherish those relationships, those individuals, that's you know, preaching and having a conversation with the choir. We want people who uh, may have never heard of us but love their community, who don't know what we do and haven't the faintest idea of what we're about, but who say, you know what, this is a community and this is what makes it special and here are the concerns and, and here are the aspirations that we have. And that's what this evening is about tonight. So it, this doesn't work if I do most of the talking. Uh, and it is, works best when we solicit uh, either you volunteer or if you make eye contact with me, I'll just assume that it's because you want to say something. So I'm not beyond doing that either. Uh, but really hearing from you. And there, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll start it out. But really, we have found that this has been most rich when, again, say uh, what is on your heart and your mind and, and express to us and, and ask us questions and push us. Uh, because at the end of the day, uh, this is about making sure that while we've been around for 93 years and there's a lot of good work that has ac been accomplished over the 93 years, uh, that the landscape of this region has changed, that the challenges have changed, that there are other opportunities that now exist, that we don't want to be simply an organization that thinks we're doing well, that makes investments, that you know, benefits from the philanthropy of the citizens, but never have been one to say, you know, are we getting it right? Is there something that we can do better? How can we be a more impactful partner? How can we be more a valuable resource to all of our 29 communities in the region, but then to the individual communities? The things that make Granby and East Granby special, the things that concern you about the community. How can we make sure that we're in a position to help uh, mitigate those concerns, help achieve those aspirations, continue the momentum, uh, and be that partner? So that's why we're here. Uh, really, uh, most importantly, to hear from you. So just to start it out, uh, give thought and, and, and share with us, what are some of the things that make this community special? Uh, my family and I are new to the greater Hartford area, but not new to the Hartford experience. We come from a, a, a town, Youngstown, Ohio is our hometown and, and where we spent the majority of our life that is very similar. Youngstown, the city, and Youngstown, the Mahoning Valley, very similar to uh, the, the greater Hartford region where we now find ourselves uh, calling it home. And it's a different experience. We spent six years in Washington, D.C. with the previous administration. So we are uh, new here and excited to be here, uh, but also very familiar with the challenges and opportunities uh, that we've seen. So specifically as it relates to Granby and East Granby, the things that uh, make it special, the things that concern you, the things that you would like to see expanded upon, the things that you would uh, hope that would be a part of uh, something that you could leave as a legacy in the community uh, to your children and grandchildren and to others. So let's just, I really want to open this up and, and, and really start a conversation hearing directly from you. Any volunteers? Susan, right? Yes, that's correct. Uh, I'd like to thank you for giving us this opportunity to meet you sure. and uh, to be here together. Uh, <clears throat> my husband and I uh, serve the community in a number of ways. We are involved in supporting young people. We're also involved in visiting older people. Uh, I breed Yorkshire Terriers, and we visit uh, a, a local rehabilitation center, so it's kind of the dog therapy thing. Um, <clears throat> in addition to that, we have a television program for which I interview many people across the state, uh, VIP people. Mm -hmm. Uh, right now, I'm in the middle of interviewing most of the people who are running for the gubernatorial okay. 2018 Lots of interviews race. Then, right? Right. Yes, <laughs> yes. So uh, we attempt to support and mentor young, old, and a broad landscape of people because our viewers probably, I want to say, they're probably ranging from 25 to 85, mm -hmm. depending on the subject and the person that I'm speaking to. The demographics are broad. I wouldn't say I'd be able to say how many men and how many women, but that's approximately the age group. One of our major foundations is called Foxfield Farm. It's for a recovery mission. And it supports veterans and first responders with PTSD and related mental issues. Uh, we had applied, I think, probably about a year ago, something less than a year ago. Um, and I'm going to be quite frank about this. Um, we were told that there would be no consideration for any, um, although they thought we had a very good purpose, mm -hmm. uh, there would be no consideration for a donation unless we had a minority on our board. Mm -hmm. um, 
I happen to have that, someone from my corporate life who i known for a long time, very qualified person. But I found it a put off for someone to say to me, we won't serve you or we won't consider you, unless that. So I think that's a detriment to, to carve something out like that and say that unless you do. Right. Uh, I think what I have on my advisory board is a broad landscape of people who are qualified, mm -hmm. who can actually get something done for our foundation, um, who are doers, mm -hmm. who will respond, uh, who are capable of me picking up the telephone and making something happen. Right. Because we are very dedicated to helping the veterans and the first responders. Sure. So that's my comment. Okay. Uh, are veterans any part of your program? Sure. Well, thank you for sharing that. And let me talk about that. And, and that's exactly the reason we're here, to have very you know, frank and productive conversations about how we can be a more invaluable partner. Uh, we do have a policy that requires our nonprofit partners to have a diverse board. Uh, we don't uh, say that it has to be any particular minority, any particular individual, or any particular ethnicity, but it does uh, take into account the diversity of the board, which should reflect the diversity of the community. Understanding that the communities that we serve in that 29 community range in diversity from some that have a very diverse population uh, to some that have a less diverse population to some that really have very little diversity at all. So that uh, policy is not meant to be exclusive. It is not meant to uh, turn away or dissuade uh, organizations from having a conversation with us about funding. But what it is meant to do is to uh, ensure, because we have a diversity of donors from across the, the spectrum of communities that we serve, is to uh, encourage and ensure that that is taken into consideration. Now, that being said, I will tell you that there are communities that have and organizations that have come to us and say, here are the, the demographic makeup, here's the demographic makeup of, of our community. Uh, the notion that, you know, that diversity policy applies to us the same way it applies to a community that is much more diverse and has the ability to draw, you know, isn't a one size fits all policy. So I can tell you and I would invite you to, uh, you know, have the, another conversation with us to talk about how we can uh, make sure that while we are very much proud of that policy, we don't want that policy to be an impediment. So to the extent that we look at and have a conversation with you about the community, about the diversity of the community, uh, and again, diversity comes in a, a variety of ways. Uh, so it, it is something that, sir, please, Judy. Yeah, I, I just want to say that we revisited that policy a couple of years ago and revised it. And there are several times in which I'm strong there. Don't hold me, but I'm pretty sure both Bravery and East Bravery are exempt from our policy, so that our policy wouldn't apply. They have it passed. Um, so it's something that we definitely want to call back and look at. The only reason I say that is <clears throat> um, I am glad I have the opportunity to Frank, mm -hmm. uh, Frank, and Candid. Otherwise, you don't solve problems. Absolutely. If the doctor tells you. Or, or avoids telling you have right. cancer, he's not going to cure it. Right. I think we need to, it's not only come together, but we need to face each other and have the truth. If we don't, Absolutely. we can't get anything done. We didn't come here so you can pat us on the back and tell us how good a job we we're doing and tell us only, you know, whisper sweet nothings in our ear. We came here to have a conversation about the concerns, the aspirations, and uh, what a wonderful way to start this off is, you know, hey, I appreciate what you guys have been doing. We have a program. You talked about all the things you're doing. We had a conversation. This is the response that we got. Uh, and that's also why uh, having the staff here, and I've told the staff, you know, don't leave me here on an island, sort of, you know, I'm the new guy, and sort of, you know, jump in and, and talk about, uh, you know, how we have looked at those policies. And they are in no means, uh, as I said, meant to be an impediment. So, uh, again, look forward to having another conversation. Uh, I think you ask in terms of veterans. Uh, absolutely. Uh, we have a strategic plan that currently talks about and prioritizes education, birth through college, uh, prioritizes uh, family and economic security and vibrant communities. And I can tell you that with the hundreds and hundreds of, of nonprofit partners that we work with, uh, those that uh, focus on veterans and, and, and assisting veterans uh, and first responders are absolutely you know, amongst uh, some of the uh, most effective and, and, and productive relationships that we have. So that is absolutely within our Sure. But it is also because it reduces domestic violence, which Absolutely. protects other spouses Absolutely. and the children. Mm -hmm. uh, it reduces the need for opioids, which is a big issue right. um, here. 
and long term what we hope to do is to provide a template so that we can take this program and actually extend it across the country. Good. Good. I'm also working with uh, some of the political uh, people on my advisory board in order that we can change legislation so that this type of therapy can be included in their coverage, their health care coverage, which will be less expensive in the long run than the opioids, the med medicine, and unfortunately the um, the opportunity to see doctors, which they are not getting now. Well, we look forward to having a, 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 another conversation with you about it. Yes. Hi, um, my name is Debbie Realitz. I'm, um, it's been exciting. I don't know a lot about the Hartford Foundation, so this has been an okay. eye-opener for me to get to um, see the staff, meet all of you, and to also see the impact it's had on Granby. I'm uh, several, You've touched my life in several ways, I'm discovering tonight. <laughs> um, <laughs> I'm a homeschool mom, okay. and so to see that you've um, given support to our library system um, and to our land trust has been an incredible blessing to me and my family, because that's our gym and that's our resource. <laughs> <laughs> so that's um, a, a big bonus to me personally. Um, the other component I am is I'm the president of the Granby Artists Association in town and the Granby Education Foundation has helped to fund some of our events um, in the past and okay. so it's been wonderful to see how your foundation has impacted our community which was new to me so thank you. Um, I'm I won't be able to stay for the whole evening, so okay. that's why I wanted to no, have an opportunity. Left you out, it's not because you're yes. a or I said something that just was really nope. beyond the pale. No, okay. please. Okay. I'm, right. I have to go teach an art class tonight, so right. um, forgive me if I have to leave early, which is partly why I'm here, is there are several community members that are working um, very diligently on creating a community center um, for the town of Granby, and one of the components that they're hoping to put in there is art space. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm here to put my two cents in that we're very excited about that. Um, we don't really have um, a public space where drops of paint are okay. <laughs> so to I'm have a access, and I yeah, I, I <laughs> so to have access to you know um, a potential space where that opportunity to make space to make art and to foster creativity within the town is very exciting. And there's a, a lot of members of the Granby artists who are excited about that um, and are eager to bring the creativity to our town right. through that. Good. Um, so that was one of the things I wanted yeah. to, and this one is my second, um, it's kind of a tangle. Okay. Um, but when you ask about, I love Granby, and one of the things that I find regionally is challenging is access to land for young farmers. And I'm, this just um, has come up. I have some amazing friends that are doing amazing work. There are organic farmers, permaculture, um, agroforestry, really um, in-depth knowledge but they're struggling because they don't have a place that they can afford to get land mm -hmm. and establish a farm. Mm -hmm. You know, the land has become so expensive because of development, you know, commercial development, um, and yet there's dead buildings and, you know, parking lots that are just laying waste. Right. Right. Um, boy, if there could be some way to resolve that right. and be able to create an, um, a way to get young farmers access to affordable land, sure. that would be huge. <laughs> well, first of all, thank you for sharing that. And, and, and three things that I heard. One, when you talked about the fact that you said you didn't know a lot about the foundation, but in looking at that, realizing that we have touched and intersected with your lives in many ways. That is, you know, coming new to the foundation, that is something that I have uh, discovered myself, that a lot of people, oh, you know, what brought you here? And, you know, I would say the Hartford Foundation and like, uh, yeah, we kind of heard of you. We're not quite sure what that is. But then, you know, they can rattle off a laundry list of things that are important to them or that they are involved in or that they know about that are things that we have supported for, you know, decades, sometimes very significantly. So that was an interesting dynamic to hear directly from you saying, wow, I didn't realize that through these programs or initiatives. 
Um, and again, we don't do it to, 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 you know, for self-aggrandizement, uh, but at the same time, you know, we're learning that we need to do a better job uh, in, in making sure that people know who we are uh, because it, it enhances in our opportunity to uh, deepen those relationships and expand those opportunities. So that's the first thing. The second thing, uh, when you talked about uh, you know, the, the notion of creating that art space and the creativity, uh, that is absolutely something that we uh, work with nonprofits across the region uh, that have uh, brought uh, art spaces and have helped to uh, facilitate and, 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 and build capacity and bring additional resources and support to artists, uh, you know, visual artists, uh, you know, artists in uh, the, the arts and music and, and, and creative arts across the spectrum. So again, we would welcome uh, a conversation about what uh, is going on here to create that space that would be of benefit not only to the artists themselves, but obviously the art and the benefit and the creativity that it brings to the entirety of the community. So we look forward to that. And an interesting dynamic, and this is what I like uh, particularly about these, is the unique things that uh, each community you know, has as, 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 as part of their thinking. And when you talked about access uh, to uh, affordable land for farmers. So, you know, in a roundabout way, our relationship and, and grants go to nonprofits. Uh, obviously, those that, well, obviously, but I mean, it is uh, those individuals, and, and we've heard about the conversation about farming and losing that generation of young farmers uh, because of, you know, the family farms aren't being passed on or the young people don't have the interest, and when they do have the interest, it becomes a series of hurdles and impediments. So how might we as a nonprofit be able to resolve that? And it isn't directly because we can, you know, purchase land and, and sort of make it available to farmers who rightfully so, you know, want to have a family business and a family farm. But the notion of working with a, a land trust uh, organization uh, that may have the mission of uh, acquiring the land. So the land trust is a nonprofit uh, that we may have a relationship with or be able to, to provide resources to. That land trust then acquires the land and makes it available to farmers for farming. So relationships like that, you know, how we can maybe not in a direct straight line to the farmers, but through the relationship of this is a problem. Here's a nonprofit organization that exists or can be created to help address that, that then allows us to provide, you know, potentially resources or support that at the end of the day is about providing, uh, you know, affordable land for those farmers that certainly provide an economic benefit uh, it, there's, so there's an employment component, uh, there's an component, component of being able to keep the land and not have it uh, subject to commercial development and expansion. Uh, there's the benefit uh, to the community of being able to have you know, more farms. I mean, so there are a whole host of things, educational. So again, thank you for raising that. And, and that's exactly what we want to, to be able to walk away from this with, not to then just say, check that box, we've had that conversation, but then to figure out what are the next steps? How can we begin to explore uh, perhaps, uh, you, you know, if that is the consensus of the community as, as one of the priorities or issues, uh, something that might allow us to ultimately help, help address that issue. So thank you. Now, I'll tell the young people, I'm going to give you, this is the first meeting that we've had, you know, more than one or two young people, so start thinking, okay, because I'm coming, I'm coming this way, all right? I, I know, you know, so I, I, I'll, I'll give you some time, but that is essential. Uh, that we hear, you know, what are the things that make the community special? What are the things you love about the community? What are the things that you, you know, think are missing that we could help with? And I can tell you that in, in one of the previous discussions, uh, you know, the, the, the residents were talking about, well, actually a teacher came, the students were there, and she brought a list of things from students, and she was not going to read it. And I said, no, 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 we have to hear the list of the students. And I mean, some of the things were, uh, you know, recreational facilities and skate parks and things like that. So, Think of some of the things that, you know, you wish you had here that we might be able to help with. Is that fair? I'm not putting you on the spot too much? Okay, all right. <laughs> Please. So my name is Melissa O'Brien. I'm a Granby resident, and I wanted to piggyback on what Debbie was saying in a couple of different ways. Um, one is that I think it's important to show up, and I've been showing up this week in a lot of different ways. And... Um, mentioned to a friend that I had met with my first selectman earlier this week to find out what was happening with the school that closed down last year. Um, and said that what I was interested in is seeing that turn into an art and education center. Um, art education community center, it used to have a playground in it, a garden center, and so following up with a friend she said, 
there are people who are really interested in seeing that happen also. They've got a proposal. They're doing that, and I'm looking at one of them, and I met another one today. So showing up, thank you for doing this, for having this, for us to show up. But I also want to say, based on the idea about you have young people who have ideas, they want to farm, they want to be involved, and I find as a trans transplant, I'm, I'm from Michigan, I spent my high school years and my college years in Flint, Michigan, and as everybody knows, Flint has seen really hard times. But one thing that's really great about when I go back to Flint is that the community has rallied around business incubation, startup, grants, all these young people are really invested in the community and making things turn around for the city. So you have people who are doing urban farming. You have all these small businesses that are starting up. And as I spend my life in Hartford, Connecticut, I moved out here in 2000, the one thing that's always struck me is, man, everything's really expensive out here. And so to hear farmers who can't get access to land, I think, I get that. And so I too see vacant spaces on 10202 where there used to be a car place and I think, oh, that would be such a great place for a skate park. And then I think of businesses that could be available for young people who have different ideas, whether it's cafes or outlets for nutrition or gyms, and they don't have the resources to spend the kind of rent that you need in Connecticut for a startup. And so going back to this idea of utilizing the current school as an art and education and possibly community business incubation center, it seems like such a great place to allow people who don't have tons of capital to come in in a very small environment with the help of Hartford Foundation for Public Giving, take a little step onto that path to make a dream a reality. And maybe it works and maybe it doesn't, but you've given folks an opportunity to at least try that, where in this current environment, that can't happen at all. So, um, so yeah, so I'm happy to be here. I really can't wait to hear what everybody else has to say, and I hope there are good connections being made today. Thank you. So I, I love the fact that you're from Flint. I'm from Youngstown, Ohio. Flint and Youngstown, you know, two sides of the same coin. Uh, automotive manufacturing, the challenge is Youngstown, a steel town, uh, and I have spent a considerable amount of time on the ground in Flint. Part of my role uh, with the previous administration was to head up the auto recovery office uh, during their GM and Chrysler restructuring, which took me to Flint and Detroit. In fact, uh, you know, the former mayor, Dane Walling, and the current mayor, you know, I got to know each other very, very well. So that same notion of how a community like Flint is transforming itself, you know, still struggling, but ideas like urban farming, which 50 years ago, you know, people just would have, 20 years ago, people would have laughed you out of the room because these were manufacturing towns. You know, they made stuff. The same way that to a certain extent, you had a great deal of manufacturing uh, in, in Hartford, East Hartford, and, and so many of those surrounding communities. And you hit on a key point that is at the core of how we are evolving as a foundation, being more nimble, more proactive, and taking more risk. You said that, you know, providing those opportunities for those entrepreneurs, it may work and it may not work, and that is okay. Historically, uh, you know, we have been much more risk averse than uh, perhaps is that then is now productive for us in this current environment and I you know it's not a surprise this you know we're, we're, we're based in Hartford and Hartford the insurance capital of the world and insurance is about avoiding risk or mitigating risk so it's not uh, you know a shock that the Hartford Foundation in this past was you know not necessarily uh, you know looking at risk like yeah give me some more of that uh, but we have understood and the board has understood and the staff has embraced and we have done so eagerly that we do need to take more risk and that some things aren't going to work out, but that's okay. What do you learn when something hasn't worked out? We all hear often about the successes of, you know, whatever the, you know, whatever, you know, you know the apps better than I do. So whatever the apps are that, you know, are just, you know, the apps that, 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 that the young people and people are just using and, and, and that are changing the face of interaction. But what we don't hear about often are the 15 iterations that failed before that. And it's interesting when you talk about those, talk to those entrepreneurs, how they don't see that failure as the end. They see that, okay, that's the lesson learned that gave me a little bit of information about how to make the next cho choice a little better, how to be a little more informed. And you are absolutely right in terms of helping to create those facilities, adaptively, whether it's adaptively reusing buildings, 
to help them become art space or incubators or, or, or multi-use spaces for a community. Uh, I've lived that in a town that has seen precipitous population decline. You've seen it firsthand. Uh, and the same thing holds here true. One of the things that I like that you know, Flint is an urban you know, town, city, uh, same as Youngstown, but facing some of the same challenges as some small, uh, more agricultural towns in terms of you've got space, how do you make that space accessible and useful and productive? Uh, yeah, and I've experienced that sort of same shock coming from uh, you know, Youngstown, Ohio, going to D.C. where the prices just were. So part of coming to Connecticut was like a, a relief because it's not Washington, D.C. prices, but it's still different than, than in Youngstown, Ohio, or Flint. So those are the types of things. And, and we want to be a resource where, you know, it's not about our ideas and our aspirations, but to really hear from the community groups how we can be either from a, you know, there's certainly a financial aspect to that that, that, that that we take into account. But the other thing is how can we be a convener and a thought leader? How can we connect some of these ideas you have to other communities that have a similar ideas or that have had similar successes? How can we perhaps bring in uh, individuals who have a, an expertise or a body of knowledge uh, that you might not otherwise be aware of or have access to to help move those ideas from the idea stage to actually uh, you know something that ultimately is, a, is an asset to this community. So uh, again thank you for sharing that and part of what uh, we are orienting ourselves to uh, in this next strategic plan that we'll be working on which these conversations are absolutely helping us to inform our next strategic plan uh, that will, uh, you know, work on this year and, and take us into the next three or four years. Part of that is this notion of how can we be more effective as a, a, a stakeholder partner in economic development, helping create economic opportunities and specifically around entrepreneurship, small businesses, uh, helping them to have access to the resources and the expertise to take those risks and, and knowing that the, the beauty of, of, of this area is that you know while there are certain expenses and costs that taking a risk here and becoming an entrepreneur here is uh, much easier not easy but easier than a place like you know we hear about the Silicon Valley and the Austin Texas and the Boston New York sometimes you can only afford to fail there once you know and, and that failure can be you know life-changing you, you put all your chips on the table and it doesn't work out and it can be devastating as opposed to here you know you can dust yourself off and pick yourself back up and still sort of find a support network and an ecosystem that is welcoming and find additional resources. So how do we take advantage of the fact, you know, we often lament the fact that, uh, you know, we're between Boston and New York the same way, you know, Youngstown lamented the fact often that we're between Pittsburgh and Cleveland or New York and Chicago, but how do we then use that to our advantage, being more nimble, being more uh, able to uh, have individuals supported as entrepreneurs and know that you know, we offer a wonderful quality of life here. Uh, we offer a, a competitive cost of living compared to those other places. So that's the other side. How can we be a, a resource and a partner in helping to uh, advance that notion uh, as a community? Are you ready yet? Sure. All right. Um, so hi, my name is Elliot. I moved to Granby a year and a half ago. From? Um, well, from all over. I had just been in Oakland. Uh, studying in seminary and I moved back to Granby okay. um, and I say back to Granby because this is my grandmother and my um, my mom and all of her siblings were raised in Granby so it was this really neat experience of moving to a place that felt a little new and also um, kind of plugging into existing networks and roots and hearing names that I n heard about growing up which was really beautiful um, and I moved and just started kind of uh, diving in into a bunch of different places, finding out what people were doing, what they were passionate about. Um, and what became really clear was that there's so much deep love and commitment in this community. And I live in East Granby. Mm -hmm. um, but also moving here and not going to high school here, it's only in the past month that I've realized that those are, uh, that there is somewhat of a difference in the communities in terms of how people identify. Mm -hmm. um, I didn't notice that just moving here because everyone's, there's the same love and commitment and passion and drive and and I found so many groups that were that had identified a need uh, at some point maybe decades ago or recently and had really like thrown themselves at this problem um, with like creativity and amazing networking and it was absolutely beautiful and also in all of the different spaces that I was I kept hearing the same thing which was that people were sad they were siloed right like the incredible work for veterans 
they're sad that they're siloed, you know, like the, the quest seems to be one of, um, yes, we can meet some needs, but mm -hmm. the rising like uh, flood of isolation and fear in our society of that isolation and kind of a sorrow of the communities that used to exist that perhaps in this region used to be centered around churches feels like it's, it's not there anymore, right? right? Churches don't form that role, but people are hungry for those places where we can come together as a community and lift up our gifts and contribute in all of the different ways that we have. And we just don't have that space, right? Like the, the senior centers have youth programming on Friday nights and it's also the space that um, like the seniors gather and play pool. So there's no food allowed in the youth center rooms, um, which is maybe like how there's no art drops allowable in art spaces. So um, what is so exciting to me about the idea of this community center is that all of these needs get to be met and people get to um, be seen and participate in like the larger community vitality. You know, our plan is to ask for a lease of Kern School from the town of Granby. Um, and because it's not, and, and our plan is like not dependent on taxpayers, mm -hmm. which would then let the doors just be flung open to you live in this space, this is your community, these are your gifts, we want to see them and honor them and also connect them because those silos are, are killing us, right? The like health cost of isolation is huge. And, and just starting to like be named and recognized. And so um, there's such incredible work and I've like absolutely fallen in love with all of it. And the dream about what could it be like if we saw and honored and felt a part of something larger than our own pockets, pockets that are so needed, but there's a special type of community I think that we're like on the verge of, we can see it and it's so powerful to see it. And so I'm so glad you're here. I'd love to invite you into seeing that with us. Um, yeah, thank that you. That is why we are here, and thank you for sharing. And that is something that we have heard in the uh, two or three conversations that we've held with communities, a, a yearning, a longing to uh, be able to congregate around a table, both a literal table and a metaphorical table, to be able to share ideas. And, you know, part of that is what makes uh, towns uh, of this size special, the ability to do that, the ability to have a... Uh, a wide array of interests and views and perspectives uh, meet at a place to share uh, and at the same time have that place be able to be transformed to something that caters and, and, and inspires and touches the, captures the heart and mind of young people and, and a, a wide array. So that is, I mean, literally why we're here as, as, as this is seen as a, uh, a priority and consensus of the community to the extent that you know, we can figure out how we can be a partner in that, uh, how, whether that's through uh, a convening of the right people around the table, whether that's through, you know, bringing, uh, you know, helping to build the capacity, uh, or whether that's through, you know, a little bit of all of the above, whether that's through, you know, the financial resources that would help to advance that notion. Um, you know, those are the ideas. That's what we want to hear. Uh, and, and, and it's, there's a uniqueness to each of the communities that we serve, as there is a uniqueness uh, to Granby and East Granby. But there is also this commonality, you know, as you pointed out. So you, you pointed out both experiences that, you know, you, you came and sort of, you know, you just feel a connection between the broader community. But at the same time, you know, you learned and, and, and began to appreciate the distinctions and the differences between the two communities. So not as something to say, well, we, we have to have two gathering spaces but something that says that that gathering space can both serve the needs and the uniqueness of each community, but at the same time, something uh, that brings us together uh, as a community of East Granby and Granby. Yeah, thank you. Yes. Okay, I'm Peggy LaRoe from Granby. Um, and some of what people have been talking about here is community, so I just wanted to address my comments to that. Um, I think for me, the biggest issue for Granby, which is a very strong local community feeling is to see what we can do to be part of the Hartford community again. I feel like in the decades I've lived here, um, there were some good things going on in the 80s. Um, you funded programs at the Holcomb Farm, I think, that okay. were arts very much like what they're trying to reestablish. Um, there were cooperative efforts. They didn't, there's many reasons they didn't go forward. Nobody gets blamed for anything. but. I feel like we've gone way backward in terms of ethnic diversity in contact and racial diversity in contact. And I really don't know what we're gonna to do to fix it. We have 
sort of uniform housing costs. We don't have any affordable housing in town. And I would just like to see the community building with the Hartford region and even East Granby. I mean, right. it, to me, we, we seem to talk about regionalizing schools for decades that I've been here, and that never happens, which is understandable. But so why not do more program communities? Why not, f for you guys, foster things that would do that? Um, the only other comment I have is um, somewhere along the line, I believe it was the policy for the Hartford Foundation not to give grants to organizations that had no executive directors. And I know in a town like this, that forecloses many good groups um, from doing that. I know you now have the Pomeroy Brace Grant through Seth Holcomb's funds. There's probably still Tudor Holcomb money out there. And it seems like maybe you guys could come up with a creative way to deal with helping groups establish an administrative structure that you would be willing to do even if there isn't a formal executive director. So that's it. So absolutely, and, and as uh, Judy pointed out in terms of the revision of the, of the policy, uh, in terms of the diversity, is, is that? Uh, executive directors is something we look at on a case-by-case -case basis because it's broader than just whether you have permanent ED or not. Um, but definitely we have funded organizations that have solely volunteer staff. And so we, we look at it on a case-by-case basis. Case. And you are? I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm Judy Rossi Battle, uh, Senior Vice President. I oversee our community. Yes. I just keep calling on this woman who has all these answers and haven't introduced her. I'm sorry. Yeah, thank you. Um, and, and, you know, yeah, so it's, there's, there's, there's that uh, consideration. And, and we also deal with the other considerations. Sometimes we have you know, so many organizations who have executive directors who are doing very similar work, who all want to tell us why, you know, their funding is so important and their, so, so our, you know, obligation to be a responsible steward of those funds, we don't want to preclude, as you talked about, uh, a organization that may not have a structure that is similar to a lot of other organizations, but is still accomplishing the work that it makes the quality of life in that community better. To your point that you started with, I, you know, is, is, is something that is, uh, you know, so notable in, 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 in a region like this. We are a region. We are, this is a state, as I learned early, early on, of 169 towns. You know, if I didn't learn anything else, you know, that's early on, 169 towns. Uh, no county, functioning government. Uh, you know, tolls, that's a whole other thing. But I mean, so I learned a, a few things early on about the state of Connecticut. Uh, and that's wonderful. And each of those towns have something unique. But at the same time, in a state that is as small as Connecticut, in a, a, a region that is a subset of a small state, there is an absolute essential uh, quality of understanding the benefits and the connections between a region. And while it was interesting that, uh, you know, talking to some folks, oh, you know, I said tonight I'm going out to Granby. Oh, wow, you're going like, you know, way out to, way out to, to Granby and East Granby. I'm like, there is no way out anywhere in Connecticut. You, can, you can't go way out in Connecticut. I mean, you know, eh. so, you know, the 40 minute drive, which I enjoyed from, from Hartford, West Hartford, it, it was a beautiful drive. But you're right, there is relevance. What happens in the city of Hartford and East Hartford Mitchell is relevant to Granby and East Granby. And, uh, the notion that somehow we can separate ourselves uh, and, and, and isolate and, and, and succeed in isolation, you know, and, and sometimes that, while is a political, uh, uh, you know, construct, in reality, we are, will rise and fall broadly as a region. Uh, what happens in Hartford, good and bad, you know, ultimately has an impact on the quality of life of the region and vice versa. And I face that as, uh, you know, in, in my own hometown of Youngstown and the surrounding communities. And while there are a lot of, you know, and I would say, first of all, self-inflicted issues that, that we as a city had and, and, and engaged in, that I was, uh, even the most uh, vociferous critics, you know, couldn't counter when I said, well, how does a better Youngstown not equate to a better Canfield and Poland and Austintown, which are the equivalent of of the surrounding communities uh, of the city of Hartford. So, you know, improvements in the relationships and the connections and the relevant uh, activities is something that we also as a foundation, as a regional community foundation, are very 
uh, aware of and, and very much a part of our priority. And we don't think it's an either or. We don't think that we have to make a choice of being a regional foundation that helps to facilitate those connections or being a foundation of 29 communities and individually servicing those communities. It's a false choice to think it's either or. It is both. A regional foundation lifting up and putting our voice and lending our credibility and our name and our resources to those issues of regional relevance and importance, while at the same time being able to have a conversation about a gathering space or some of the things that are specific to Granby and East Granby. Uh, and part of what we are redoubling our efforts in doing is doing just, uh, are, are redoubling our efforts in doing just that. Uh, recently, the Connecticut uh, Commission on, on Fiscal Stability and Economic Growth issued a, a series of recommendations and reports and it wasn't that we took a position on you know which ones were good or bad the fact that the status quo is unacceptable uh, is something that we are very much weighing into uh, the fact that the structural issues of the state of Connecticut and the structural issues of the city of Hartford are ultimately uh, going to impact this region is something that we as a community foundation are uh, weighing in on. Well beyond that we're also now working with the Community Foundation of uh, Greater New Haven, uh, the Eastern Connecticut Foundation and, and other foundations across the state to collectively weigh in on these issues. So I, I really appreciate the fact that the recognition of this is a region and how can we uh, while maintaining the the quality of life and the uniqueness of Granby and East Granby also recognize that your contribution to the region uh, and, and the other communities that are, uh, you know, 40 minutes away from here as a part of the region, uh, those issues that, that connect us are issues uh, that, you know, we don't want to bury heads in the sand and sort of just say because, you know, and, it, and it, it goes well beyond, you know, people can argue about regionalizing schools or regionalizing this. There are a whole host of issues and things that can be done, uh, and that's not necessarily even, even a, a solution or an answer. There are a whole host of things before you even get to conversations about cooperating in other ways uh, that we think and that we have seen are, are vital to communities and, and communities across the country that have recognized that and how to act and think as a region as appropriate and productive are those communities that are, are, you know, are doing well and those communities that still see themselves as very fractured places uh, you know, continue to struggle. Yes. Um, my name is Ken Moaning. I live here in Granby, and I need to just turn the mic back because you just said everything I wanted to say. Oh, sorry. As well as this young lady. <laughs> um, um, I, I heard about the Hartford Foundation coming here, and I saw the title, Greater Together, was what encouraged me to come because that's what, to me, is all about is local community. Connecticut is too small. I, I was born and raised in Connecticut, so I don't know about Youngstown, Ohio, all things right. like that, but I do know Connecticut. You can go anywhere from east to west in two hours. I, so. That's exactly. Not only have I said what you said, that's a quote that I've, and I've just, in my mind, I think it's like two hours you can get from anywhere you Absolutely. want. So we Absolutely. Gotta, all right. So it's, it's all good. But there's so much division, unfortunately, in the little, count, little towns, and everybody does things separately. We need to do things together. It's a whole economic. I saw a great article, read a great article, I think it's in Harvard Current or the Harvard Business Journal, talking about regionalization and the concept. I hadn't really thought about right. I've been involved with the Equity Task Force on the Board of Ed and things like that, and there's diversity challenges and all these different things that, especially we're on the, the economy, can be resolved just by coming together. Right. Just, and I love the, even the graph of the uh, Hartford County that you have here where you have the little divisions there could very easily group those together in a small area. They handle a lot of the, some of the challenges that we have. So I'm all for whatever we can do to I appreciate bring it, it together. And, and again, that doesn't mean negating or erasing or a bigger community has more sway or say so or the things that make Granby, East Granby or Manchester or Avon or Simsbury special go away. But it does recognize that some of these things you know, will only be other, because it's not just about, you know, the region and, and, and our place, specifically when we talk about, uh, you know, economically, you know, being a competitively economic region, this is, you know, don't think Boston, New York, I mean, and, and you can think Midwest or Silicon Valley, but thinking beyond that, you know, uh, thinking that this is, and recognizing that this is a global economy competing for talent and resources and investment, you know, we ought to think of ourselves and not how do we become a competitive global region you know with the manufacturing prowess that exists here with the educational institutions that exist here with the cultural institutions that are here with all of those assets how can we see ourselves as competing for you know retaining the talent that we have attracting other talent now i mean 
uh, you know, for people who have got a problem with the first or second day of spring facing a, you know, a potential snowstorm, I mean, there's not much we can do about that. So, you know, you know, but, but setting that aside, all of the things and the assets here that if positioned and leveraged in a cooperative and collaborative way can bring significant benefit to the community while still maintaining, you know, the things that make it a place that is special to you in terms of that community. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Uh, I'm Tammy Zawistowski. I'm state representative for East Granby, Suffield, and a portion of Windsor. And I want to thank the Hartford Foundation for not only having this listening tour today, but also for all the good works that you've done for our communities. It, it does impact a lot of us. Um, I came here mostly to listen tonight, uh, but there, is, there are some concerns that my, my constituents have voiced. And one of the big ones is engagement of young people who are not college bound. A lot of these, these uh, young people, um, really need to be able to have some role models that are, are not uh, in the education system or are not in you know, professionals. They need people that, that work with their hands. They need to be able to have a purpose. And I think that that's something that you could possibly help out with as far as you know, mentorships or even maker space. Absolutely. Um, I think that, you know, and, and I think it would help a lot with some of the, the, the drug situations that we have um, so, I mean, I think that's, that, that's a, a natural. And one of the things, we've been talking a little bit about uh, regionalization. Uh, I serve as a ranking member on planning and development, and one of the things that we're focused on is uh, removing some of the obstacles to regional cooperation for the towns. Good. We're taking Good. first steps this year. We'll Good. work on the harder stuff in, in coming years, but we're looking at the hello hanging fruit. We've got a bill coming out that's, uh, that'll be voted on this session. Thank you for that leadership and political courage in doing that. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, thank you. Thank uh, you. And, and I couldn't agree with you more in terms of making sure that there are pathways uh, to success in life uh, for uh, all people, but particularly young people, uh, that really recognize and help to leverage the gifts, the aspirations of where they are and where they desire to be. You're correct. Uh, you know, there is a, a path for everyone, uh, but that path doesn't necessarily lead to, to college. For those that it does lead to college and, and to go on to get their PhDs or the MBAs or the engineering degrees, that is absolutely wonderful. For those that lead to uh, a, a, a two-year uh, program, that's wonderful. For others who say that's not the path at all, but the path is, you know, some uh, skill set or certification that allows them to tap into that creativity. Uh, and, and, and you all as educators know this better than I, that we lost for a, a long time or, or, you know, a generation. And again, speaking from uh, the community I grew up in, where 50 years ago, if you had a strong back and a strong work ethic, you could go to the mills in Youngstown or go to the plant in Flint. Uh, you know, make a, a good living with benefits and retirement and take care of your family. And that has changed dramatically. It hasn't changed to the extent, to the extent where you have to have your, you know, your, your degree from one of the wonderful colleges that exist here, but it has changed to the extent that we also lost the pathways in some of our high schools of the vocational, the shop classes that the, 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 the young people could go to uh, and express themselves and be productive in ways that were different uh, than some of their colleagues. And this other notion, and the President Obama was very big on this, is that we have to stop, and for a long time we categorized that as sort of a, a, a secondary choice, that it wasn't aspirational to do something with your hands. It wasn't aspirational to you know, go onto a shop floor or to be an entrepreneur or be a creator or have that maker space, that somehow that was less uh, or it, uh, somehow inferior to someone who you know, wanted to go uh, on Wall Street or Silicon Valley or you know, be a, a, a medical or, or a legal professional. And nothing could be further from the truth because what we're seeing now, particularly here in Connecticut, is there are a host of opportunities now and growing opportunities in the future that what those employers want aren't necessarily people that have a four-year or even a two-year degree, but they have the skills, the certification, the ability to think critically, even the assembly line, the assembly line that... 20 or 30 years ago, it was like, do these five steps. Don't think about it. Don't ask any questions. Do the five steps. Do them in this order, and that's what we want. Now we're saying we want people who can think, is there a better way to do this? Is there a better, more efficient way? Is there a safer way to do this? We're not concerned about the degree you have hanging on your wall or don't have it hanging on your wall. We're concerned about the fact that you, as a potential uh, employer or th employee, are thinking entrepreneurially. Even if you choose to be an entrepreneur or not, we want you thinking entrepreneurially. 
So that is a, a significant part of the discussions that we're having. How do we work with uh, some of our partners uh, to make sure that there are multiple pathways, multiple opportunities for young people? Uh, and part of what we want to make sure we're doing is hearing directly from the young people, not just assuming. You know, what is it that they aspire to? What is it that captures their imagination? What is it that, and it looks much different uh, than perhaps when we were going through the educational system. So uh, thank you for raising that, and that is absolutely something that, you know, those partners uh, that have uh, expertise in that area, uh, talking directly to the young people uh, uh, about those pathways and those opportunities is, 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 is key. So let me ask you to share, since we're talking about young people, so again, just share with us your you know, thoughts of, of, of the community and, and, and you know, what is here, what might be lacking, mm -hmm. what, you know, uh, what, tell me your name. My name is Caitlin Stragowski. I'm actually from East Granby. Uh -huh. I go to East Granby High School. Um, and you're how old, Caitlin? Caitlin, yes. Caitlin, I'm sorry, how old? I'm 16. 16, okay. That took a second, sorry. <laughs> um, well, first of all, I want to say I'm kind of like one of the products of all of these um, charity, like not charity, but uh, cooperations and events. I was part okay. with Alicia and Nourish My Soul. And so she was actually part of what would be going into that community center. Okay. So that would be a really cool thing to do because Good. we do a lot of things. We do like cooking and we do all the stuff. And it would be really cool to have that kind of space. Um, besides that, looking at the schools, I kind of support what she was saying because talking to a lot of my friends, I'm a junior in high school now. We're looking on to colleges and what we want to do. And it would be really cool to have some kind of outlet for internships. Okay. Because a lot of us want to try things. Like I personally want to go into math and okay. I'm looking at engineering and stuff, but I want to be able to get that hands-on experience and understand what I'm going into okay. before I get into it. Got it. So that would be something cool. And um, I love East Granby. I love the small aspect where every teacher knows your name. So like I like to stay away from the whole regionalizing idea. I don't okay. like it. <laughs> um, but... One thing that we have been trying to change is with uh, a few of my friends, our lunch program is really falling by the wayside. It's not gotten a lot of um, interest from our leaders. Okay. So what we've been trying to do is bring in healthier foods because much of what the kids want in school is healthier foods because we're understanding now that it's better for your bodies and you just feel better. So we've been trying to make this in. So if there's any way to support businesses to give to the schools and... Oh, yeah. Um, <laughs> I don't know if anyone's heard about it, but we've been trying to, we did a, tried to do a partnership with Granby, and the East Granby's issues were not part of our school lunch, the school lunch program, the nationwide school lunch program. So our current administration is really worried about its grants, losing all these grants to help pay for kids who get the milk money and who get all this extra money. So that's a, been one of our many hurdles is trying to do this, to get this healthier lunches in. We had a bunch of opportunities, but a lot of it fell through because the businesses can't upkeep with the financial costs of supporting us for a lunch program. Because currently, right now, we just buy from outside businesses and bring it in. And then we would pay them back for it. But they can't pay for it. It's getting to be too much money. Mm -hmm. So if there's any way to support businesses or support us in a way to create that bond with uh, different restaurants, it would be much sure. appreciated. Well, thank you very much for sharing all of that. Uh, and, and those are exactly, that perspective and, and, and your willingness to articulate that, what you and your friends are, are, are thinking and, and capturing. Uh, you know, from the internship, and I couldn't agree with you more, I mean, had I had, I had a uh, mathematics or engineering internship uh, prior to entering into college, it perhaps would have saved me the five or six quarters of calculus and differential equations before I realized you know, and, and you can tell I am, I, my, I am not an engineer. I have a, a degree in business administration, business administration and finance. So you can, that tells you what my engineering experience was. And the internship perhaps would have saved me from that and explaining, uh, you know, a, a couple of early on grades to my parents. And eventually, you know, we got, we got over. Uh, but that notion of being able to uh, provide those opportunities uh, for young people and, and working with community partners uh, that, and, and businesses and, and other stakeholders that would be willing to do that. Um, you know, tied in, in a longer run, when you talk about the uh, desire to have healthier uh, options in schools, you know, you can draw a line to this notion when we were talking about, uh, oh, she left, uh, the uh, ability to have uh, local farmers, you know, who are productive and able to farm 
you know, what better group of folks to have that conversation with, to have potentially it coming from local farms into local schools, providing students uh, with those choices. So again, not easy, uh, but uh, if identified as a priority, you know, what we want to do is figure out what conversation or what role we might have in facilitating that. So thank you for sharing that. Appreciate it. Hi, my name is Donna Snyder, and I'd like to spend just a couple of minutes talking about the other end of the age spectrum, specifically our sure. seniors. You guys aren't close to the same age? <laughs> no? I'm, uh, I'm vice chair on our current Commission on Aging in Granby, and I've been uh, for the last three or four years volunteering with the Senior Center, and I've gotten to know quite a few folks here. Um, the concerns that we've heard in the commission is specifically to raise the concerns, to, to understand what the concerns are, and bring them to the attention of our local officials. Right. It's fading a little bit. Is this any better? That's better. Okay. So the Commission on Aging is to be able to raise the concerns for the seniors to the local officials um, so that programs and, and uh, other items can be taken into consideration. So the senior concerns, like numerous Connecticut towns, we have the Yankee self-sufficiency. People want to do for themselves. I've heard that many seniors want to stay in Granby, but they see challenges such as affordable housing, um, the taxes, the, the upkeep of the housing, um, there's also concerned healthcare-wise with adult daycare. The commission has uh, recently done a study townwide of uh, folks 50 and older, and one of the items that came back was that people really are interested in adult daycare. Right. Now, whether that can be something that would be part of a community center, um, also with the seniors, maybe who don't require the adult daycare, maybe that could be part of mentoring. There could be intergenerational possibilities, again, with the community center. But um, there are numerous folks, as your graph has shown, the senior population is increasing at least for a short right. additional years. Uh, but they, they definitely have concerns on how will they be able to stay here. They want to stay here, uh, the affordable housing that was mentioned previously. But thank you. Absolutely. And, and again, things that we have heard uh, in other communities uh, added to that, you know, in a couple of communities we heard transportation, access to transportation, uh, having a, a place where you can have that interaction between intergenerational uh, res uh, residents of a community that provide those benefits. And while all of those things aren't things that we necessarily have the ability to solve, uh, the thing that it was common was a place, a facility, a space to gather that then gives the community, you know, an opportunity to, if, if we have one piece of the puzzle that we can help facilitate, then that advances the notion of being able to talk about, you know, the programming that goes on or how those connections are made. That is, you know, for uh, you all as community members and stakeholders to then begin to imagine and, and, and continue to talk with us how we can advance it. So that issue of, Again, you know, coming back, and I'm, I'm trying to, you know, find those areas where there's some commonality. And one of those is, you know, a space that allows for uh, flexible programming, flexible initiatives, flexible use uh, that really speak to and is owned by and, and, and driven by members of the community. Uh, that then also then provides opportunities to figure out what are other partnerships that exist they can help enhance what goes on in that space or the use of that space. So thank you for that. Uh, yes? Um, I wanted to say that I wrote an article in March issue of the Granby Drummer. Mm -hmm. It probably addresses five or six of okay. elderly people, the mentoring to young people, the reciprocal mentoring back to the senior people. Okay. Uh, it would probably cover most of these things. I urge them to keep current school. Uh, for that very purpose, mm -hmm. it would address all of this okay. and so, make good use of the space. Okay. So again, uh, would l welcome that conversation. Um, yes. 
Um, I'm Alicia Newton. So I get the pleasure of working with young people like Caitlin, right. um, and also with veterans, um, some senior citizens, and farmers. So I have a, a unique perspective about our area. East Granby has a large veteran population. They have the, um, the air guard mm -hmm. that's based right there. Um, and then Granby has the high farmers population. Both of them are actually facing record numbers of suicide rates right now. Um, so I think that was kind of a driving force when I started having conversations with other community members. We were looking for a space for our nonprofit mm -hmm. um, to do, we do a lot of culinary, nutrition, community building around food. And I was realizing there's a lot of need that is outside of our scope. And when we began having conversations about what these demographics really need, what our community really needs. It was, you know, the maker space. It was um, an artist space, you know, a place where kids can be kids and not have to worry about spilling something right. or making it dirty. Um, and just having a place where people can come and feel ownership. And I really think that right now we have, we're very connected via social media and things like that, but we're also extremely isolated and people are really craving that sense of right, community right. and and that's showing up in a lot of areas where you know where depression mental illness um, suicide rates drug use and um, I really I thank you for coming and listening to this because I think what I'm hearing from the community as I've been talking to people about it about a community center and the excitement is immediate you know right. everyone's their eyes get big and right. they're like, yes, that is what Granby needs. Right. And they say, you know, I've been wanting X, Y, and Z. And I'm like, yes. And we, you know, make the connection mm -hmm. with someone who yeah. offers that. Right. And, you know, something like Kern School where it has the space where that would be, um, mm -hmm. we can accommodate all of cool. that is, is kind of the dream, which seemed really unlikely when we right. first, when Elliot and I first started having this conversation. But the more people we talk to and then, you know, Ironically, you're having this listening session, right. and it's like, wow, well, <laughs> maybe this is meant to be, and maybe people are ready for this. Right. So thank you. I, I thank you for coming Absolutely. and hearing this. <laughs> so we have time for one more. Superintendent? Oh, I'm sorry. Okay. Uh, sorry, Did, didn't mean to trump you. <laughs> um, but, you know, privilege. No, um, as the first selectman that uh, Ms. O'Brien spoke to, um, I did have the benefit of working for the town of Windsor in a previous life, and they have L.P. Wilson Community Center, which is outstanding. It's got a day, adult daycare, it's got artists' places, it's got a gym, and Kern School does fit that. So I'm just to let you all know, I'm fully in favor of that. The one of the challenges <clears throat> that I know the town has is because it's no longer a school, mm -hmm. we would have to bring it up to code. Mm -hmm. um, not that it was unsafe right. or anything, but just that, you know, it's no longer that occupancy. Gotcha. So what I'm asking is what specifically can the Hartford Foundation do, and then what are the, the next steps to sure. make that happen? Well, that's a, that's a great um, uh, way to, to bring this to a conclusion. Uh, First and foremost, it was critical for us to, to have an opportunity to hear uh, ideas, aspirations, concerns, uh, but then again, not to just have this be a session where we sort of have this ambiguous set of ideas, which is, uh, you know, and we sort of walk away and, 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 and think that we, you know, have accomplished. The idea here is to capture this, uh, to work with you all to, to figure out how to then begin to prioritize and figure out what are some of the pragmatic next steps. For instance, and, and, and again, uh, if, if this, the, the idea of a community center uh, and the idea of using a, a already existing building and, and adaptively reusing that is of interest, uh, you know, what we would want to do is we'd invite uh, some representatives to sit down uh, and then map out, you know, what might be the steps that would be necessary to, to you know, where we might provide, um, you know, financial resources. Uh, where we uh, would be working in concert, again, with a community priority to help identify uh, other partners that might be uh, in terms of programming or 
uh, you know, what would be necessary to take it from where it is now to ultimately, you know, the community center that is uh, the, the broadly talked about. So what we'll do is, is capture this and, and, and come back to uh, you all with, a, uh, you know, something that reflects what we've heard uh, and then some specific things and in, in conversations that could then take this from concept to those next steps. Again, without being able to, to know exactly, you know, what the funding requirements would be and how much we would be willing to or in willing and able to sort of contribute to that. Also then talk about how perhaps an investment from the Hartford Foundation could leverage and attract other resources. Uh, you know, we've been blessed with significant resources, but clearly there's a finite amount of, of, of ability we have and, and a whole host of other uh, parameters that we operate under. But that's uh, what I would say is that, you know, hearing this, being able to come back and say, this is what we think we've heard, did we get it right? And these seem to be the emerging priorities. How can we then take some next concrete steps to, to see, you know, what, what happens next? I will also say, and, and, and an idea that uh, was just, we found to be exceptionally phenomenal, is the idea of helping and having a conversation about establishing a community fund where, uh, you know, we've had conversations with previous communities about us seeding a community fund that then provides resources uh, to, uh, you know, the community to start making some of its own decisions and having the resources uh, to, uh, help advance some of those things. Uh, a fund that would uh, provide an endowment to, a, to, a, to an extent of established in perpetuity that could be used to attract other funds, but also having a component of the fund that could be used right away to address some of these issues. So uh, that was an idea that came up in whatever. Oh, there's already a grand B. Okay, well, good. But um, I sit on that um, committee for. Okay. We would love to talk more about. Absolutely. Okay, all right. That it's, it, it, and, and, and so to the extent that we have been here for 93 years, we'll be here for you know, uh, another 93 years and then some, uh, we will always be a partner, but also want to, to the extent that uh, Melissa just pointed out, make sure that there are resources that you all you know, see as tools and, and, and ability to advance some of these things. So getting back with some specific <coughs> Uh, things that we've heard and then starting some conversations and meetings and engagements about how we could take it from you know con concept to doing the due diligence to ultimately hopefully advancing some of these things but wanting you all to know here and you know going forward and sharing with others we are your community foundation that you know for those who didn't know a lot about us and, and now know a little bit more uh, we want to continue those conversations those relationships we want to be seen as a valuable partner. We want to be seen as responsive uh, to the issues and the needs. We want to be seen as proactive and creative uh, and nimble as, as a resource and a tool uh, to really continue to keep the quality of life here, to increase the quality of life, to address some of the concerns, both on a town level of Granby and East Granby, but also with an eye toward uh, creating the vibrancy uh, that is deserved and, 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 and the potential that exists in this entire region. Because one thing I did hear is we're going to need um, help taking the carpets up so they can spill paint right. on the floor. <laughs> but, uh, no, so, but I think it would address, you know, so many things with, with diversity, with the arts. I, I, with, I, absolutely. And, you know, and having so any this help. morning being on my knees getting <clears throat> grape juice out of the carpet, you know, that, that Ethan was, yeah, so I, you know, yeah. that notion of being able to spill things, right. you know, without... But really, so thank you all for showing up. Somebody talked about, sh you talked about showing up. And, you know, us showing up, uh, you know, is less important than you all showing up. Uh, and not just showing up, but then sharing with us. And, and, and starting off, you know, very candidly and frankly, and I appreciate getting off to that uh, notion and us being able to address that right away and then uh, having a wide array of conversations. So thank you for sharing your perspective, all of you. Uh, for your time and we look forward to uh, being oh and the comment cards my staff is reminding me for those of you uh, please by all means uh, utilize the comment cards you can pop those in the mail uh, post is paid or, or leave them with us here uh, tonight so thank you all very much for your hospitality we appreciate it thank you.